Hey everybody, welcome to the Dad Challenge Podcast. My name's Josh, thanks for joining me today. We're talking about something crazy. My haters, just kidding, sort of, yes. Today I'm gonna debunk or try to argue or counter argue or debate with my haters who have these stupid things to say about what I do in this channel. Now, some people might have valid criticisms and there are, and I'll address those as well. But I wanna look at the overarching thing of what I do here in this channel and basically, why am I so effing mean to these people? Do they deserve it? I mean, let's find out. So, as I said at the beginning, <clears throat> these are assholes. Okay? But I've got a following of hate, and it's not too bad. Right? They're, they're okay. They're, they, some of them get really crazy and they call me a pedo and all this kind of stuff. But some of them are just like, look, I don't like that Josh makes fun of people's looks. I don't like that uh, he secondhand exploits these people. He's just bullying women. He's a misogynist. Like, eh. You know, I get that. I understand that to a degree. The thing that bugs me the most about those criticisms is that they never address who I'm bullying or making fun of or whatever. It's always the who. Like, my... In, in the real world, me, I am this guy. What you see in front of the camera, I'm this guy. I'm really nice. I'm pretty, actually pretty shy if you get to know me at first. And then when I get to know you, I'm like the crazy fun guy. But I'm, this is who you get. This is who I am in public as well. Um, do I snark on people? In my head, yeah, I do all the time. I love to people watch. It's just who I am. I'm, I'm just snarky. I'm a snarky guy. Not everybody deserves it, of course. But this is who I am. Right, and so in the real world, when I get out there, and I, and I, I respect women. I think women are amazing. I think moms are amazing. I think overall, in general, women are just the better species. I, I'm not saying that to be a simp. I just believe it because dudes are guys can be dicks. Women are better than men. Just overall, as human beings, they're just better. So that's kind of where I stand on that. But. Ever since embarking on this adventure on YouTube, where I've been calling out child exploiters, it was by accident that this happened anyway. I had a podcast going with a couple of dudes called the Dad Challenge Podcast, and it was fun. And a lot of us were adopted dads, a lot of us came from church and had hurt church backgrounds, and some of us were still in church and weren't hurt by the church, and we were talking about cool things like, you know, mental health and men and how we hate our teenagers. We didn't hate them, we just, it's a funny video. Um, and it was a great podcast. It was really, really, really fun. And then Mike Stoffer happened. Something clicked when that thing went down that made me so upset that I just decided to get on the channel and talk about it. Right? From the perspective of an adopted dad. Now, a lot of you here might be new. You don't realize I have adopted children. I have two adopted older children. Uh, they're adults now. And we have two biological children. Okay? And so, we adopted out of the necessity. It wasn't a plan in our life to adopt or anything like that. I'm glad we did. We love our sons. You know, and it's not always, you know, happiness and rainbows and everything else. But we did it out of a necessity because that's what family does. And I, I believe that, which is why the Ruby Frankie thing really hits me hard. And I'm really, 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 really mean to the rest of the family because I don't think that they stepped up enough when they could have. Okay. So that's another reason I'm mean to them. But all that to say, when Micah did that to the adopted child, it pissed me off from the perspective of an adoptive dad. And then it just happened. Before that, I didn't think anything of family vloggers. Even during that, I didn't really think anything of family vloggers. Everything that I've learned... I've done it along the way. The Micah Stoffer thing, it was just more about, okay, well, she's obviously exploited this child, made a bunch of money on it, and then it started clicking. Okay, well, this is wrong too. And then it started becoming this pattern of like, okay, there's so many people who do this. And then I branched out into Micah Stoffer's friend groups. That was Love Meg, not Love Meg. It was uh, Bits of Bish. It was Our Life. It was a bunch. And then it started expanding out from there. And then I started waking up about a year into it. I'm starting to say, okay, no, I'm in this fight. I think that this is wrong. This is happening to kids. And then a bunch of other crap started happening. A bunch of really disgusting things that I started waking up to that nobody was really seeing. Okay, well, they were, but they weren't really. Okay, that's when I discovered the LeBrant family and Everly LeBrant with, she was seven years old with like dance leotards and stuff on Instagram. And I bought the analytics and I discovered who was actually looking at these analytics. One of my mods then even sent me this thing. Hey, have you heard about these predator playlists? Then we uncovered the predator playlist and we saw with our eyes that predator playlists exist. And they still do, by the way. Okay, and so then we started along the way getting more and more angry. A lot of people say, I like jo early Josh. Right, I wasn't so snarky, I wasn't so mean, but the reason why it shifted was because I actually started waking up to actually what was going on. 
Okay, and then I'm starting to get upset and pissed off at these people, and I really have no recourse at all. I can't legally do anything to them. It's getting back to these children to sue their parents one day, if not. But my my battle, my weapon of choice, was to make fun of them because they absolutely deserve it. Now, I did make fun of Micah a lot, and she was like, she's like the Ricky from Trailer Park Boys of the Family Law community with all the stupid things she said and the cookies and everything. She was funny. So my snark did start a little early. It didn't kick off as snark. It just kind of evolved into snarking on people because they deserve it. And that's gonna be the overarching theme here of what I do here in this video, okay? The reason that I do what I do is to twofold. The kids, the kids can't, the kids don't have a voice. They don't have legal representation. They don't have someone fighting for them. Um, maybe in the background they do, but they don't have someone publicly saying, this is wrong. And I'm not saying that, like they asked me to do that. I'm just saying that's what I do because I think anybody standing by and watching this, you should try something, okay? And two, they deserve it because that's what they deserve. I don't know what else to say. You deserve, you are, if you are ch exploiting children, low level abusing them, which I think this is and could be considered abuse, which in my opinion, exploiting children is abuse. I think it's abuse, right? These kids cannot give informed consent to being on camera. They cannot give informed consent when you talk about the periods, when you, when you open their mouth on camera for the dentist, when you tell them about all their, you know, autism and everything else that they have and all and just share all these personal information with the whole world they don't have you don't have their consent to do it and so in my opinion what you're doing is actually abuse and the only recourse i really have here is to just make fun of your stupid ass and a lot of people get upset with me okay and i understand why and a lot of people like were with me at the beginning now they hate me now because i made fun of something that likely they had maybe they have a club thumb or they have they're too shiny and they're like well hey i'm shiny and so they get upset because something triggers them, right? And I understand that, okay? I am not for everybody, okay? When people ask me what I do for a living, if they're my friends and all that kind of stuff, or if I get to know somebody, I say, look, this is what I do. It is not for everybody. I almost wish people don't, don't go look at it, okay? I just, because I'm like, look, I, it's not for everybody, okay? It really isn't. But I think I've grown to, what, 260,000 subscribers for a reason. In the community that is anti-family vlogging, I consider myself one of the largest voices against anti-family vlogging. There are a couple big ones. On TikTok, you've got Mom Uncharted, who does a great job. She does it differently than I do. And I appreciate and respect her for the way that she does it. She doesn't call people out by name. She she blurs everything, even including the people who do it, because she, she doesn't want to get kicked off TikTok. But she that's just her way, and I respect it. Okay, she, she might not respect the way I do it, but we all have different ways of doing things. This community started out with a bunch of people and the, and the one that rose to the top was this channel. And that's because of you. And I think me saying the things that you are thinking. I think a lot of people would agree with me that I'm just saying what you're thinking. We're also having a little bit of fun with it because why not have a little bit of fun in a serious cock? And I got a bunch of notes here and that's gonna touch on that a little bit. And so, but one of the things that comes with YouTube is, is, a, is a following of hate that you get. And that is, it is what it is. It comes with the territory. I've accepted it. I actually don't mind it at all. I think it's kind of funny. I read it not every day, but I, you know, I'll catch up and see what people are saying about me and all that kind of stuff. And it's kind of funny. They often say the exact same things, which is why I have the arguments here. Um, but that just comes with the territory. And the reason why other creators like me don't have the threads is because these threads are often uniquely made for family vloggers. If you go to Reddit or you go to like Kiwi Farms and all these other places, um, even all over, it's generally the hate snark threads are for influencers and family vloggers. And so obviously because I am in that world, I've got my own snark thread and it's kind of, I'm flattered, right? And so it just comes to territory, does it bother me? It only bothers me when people lie about things that are actually crazy to lie about, like me being a pedo. No, nope, it's all been lost and it's all been crazy. I have videos on it, okay? It's not even worth re repeating because it's such a stupid lie that these people do. They're so stupid because they just, they want to hate you so bad. And I understand that because I hate these people so bad, but not to the point where I will lie about them. That's the difference between my snark and these people's snark. Okay. I'm not going to lie about these people. I'll just disseminate their shit right in front of your face and we'll make fun of them. Okay. So that's the difference. I'm not making salacious lies. Otherwise they could sue me and lots of creators have tried to sue me. Dr. D Dozen has tried to sue me multiple times, has sent me multiple letters, and then said, well, we're coming to sue you now, and they never did, because they would lose, because I don't lie. I just give commentary my opinion based on their content, 
Now, if I was lying and saying, oh, I know they're cooking meth in their basement, that could get me in a lot of trouble or that they're abusing their children. That can get me a lot of trouble. Like really, you know, that's abusing was what I was saying. If I don't have proof to back it up, now when I say they're abusing them by exploiting them, I can back that up by just showing you their content, right? And so that's the one thing that kind of differs, right? And, and, and the crazy hate that people just like, the, the funniest part about the hate is that like these people hate me so damn much and yet they'll watch every nostril flare and breath that I take on this channel and every gray hair that I got since I started. And they'll comment on it when all you have to do is not watch, asshole. And a lot of people are like, well, Josh, you hate these people, but you watch. The difference is I get paid for this, they don't, okay? Now, I would be dishonest if I said that being paid for this isn't a good benefit, a perk. It is a great benefit and it is a great perk of this. The other perk is, is that because when I was young and I grew up with no justice and the abuse that I suffered and everything else and the bullying and everything else, the re this is why I do it. I never got it. And so I want to be that voice. I wish I had someone speaking out for me when I was young, like the way I do it now. Now, a lot of these kids might not get Chad Frankie doesn't like what I do. Okay, I respect Chad Frankie for what he's out there doing. He's making jokes about it. He's getting the help he needs and everything else. And he's, he's the victim, right? But some of the kids don't like it. And that's just the way it is. A lot of them, family members will reach out to me about family vloggers and be like, you're dead on. I'm not allowed to talk about it because as soon as I tell somebody I will not speak about them, I won't. Because I want to keep that. I want to keep the lines of communication open. And I'm not just going to give it away for a video. Right? If they say I can speak about it on a video, then I will. I spoke to uh, John Goslin the other day on the phone for about an hour and he said I could speak about it and I will. I'll do a video on our conversation. Right? I speak to these people. I speak to their families. I speak to immediate friends and family who no longer align with what they're doing or what they're seeing because these people often change for the worse too, by the way. So all that to say, I'm not for everybody but I'm also for 260,000 people. <laughs> so let's take a look at some of the arguments. And some of those arguments piss me off because they're so dumb. Okay, they're so dumb. One of the arguments I get, and I hate this argument the most because it just, mm, it bothers me. And I have, I wrote all my notes down so I'm gonna be looking at my notes a little bit. But the argument is that you are secondhand exploiting these children, right? Um, here's why this is stupid as shit. Okay, because I'm not the one who put them on the internet. Also, my content, my content is not geared towards the children. I'm not putting a child up on the screen and snarking on the child, right? If the child is in the video, I try to blur it out. I don't always do it. Sometimes I want you to see because I think the, the, the impact of seeing visually what's going on is, is important. And I think that's it's part of it. I don't have to blur anybody's faces, right? I don't have to. It's just kind of been the standard practice for everybody in this space, and I understand why. So I don't always do it, but I try to, right? Um, but it's the purpose of the critique, right? Listen to this. My content is not for exploitation. It's to critique these families. I'm drawing attention to them by snarking on them. And it's it's about the ethical issues of family vlogging, the ethical issues about taking their money, about where it's going and how there's no laws in place for it. Unlike family vloggers, my main purpose here isn't to exploit children at all. I don't do it at all. But it's to discuss the implications of what is happening in their lives and the people that are doing it. Does that make sense? My focus is on the adults. It critiques the actions of the adults and the people that are exploiting the children, not the children. Now, some people will get upset if I say something here and there, but always in the end, it's about the children and the children are always the victims in these scenarios, always. Now, some people are like, oh, you made fun of Alex for making these TikToks. We turned 18 years old and decided to go down the path. These children want to continue down these paths when they become adults. They're kind of fair game. If they're out there taking people's money for garbage content, that's just the way it is. The content I create covers the decisions and behaviors of the parents, not the children involved. Public interest. My commentary serves a public interest by highlighting the ethical concerns, the privacy issues and potential negative impacts on the kids that, we're ta that, that they're exploiting. Now, I, I, I hesitate to say this because I'm not like, Ugh, you know what I mean? It is, you know, journalism presenting. I'm not a journalist, but it is akin to journalism or it's social commentary for sure. But it's, you know, it's it's in parallel with with journalism and it serves to inform, protect rather than exploit. OK, I want to inform people about what's going on. There's an ethical difference as well. Exploitation implies using someone for one's own advantage, typically selfishly or unfairly. My content uses the vloggers public action as a basis for discussion and its critique which is different from exploiting individuals for personal gain, in my opinion. 
Again, I'm not putting a kid on the screen and like roasting the kid for whatever reason, right? I'm not doing that. Sometimes the kid's behaviors are a direct reflection of the parents, and so I will point it out, okay? My platform is for advocacy. Not all the time, but for a lot of it. You know, overarching, it is. By addressing these issues, I'm advocating for better standards and practices within the content creation, particularly child welfare and exploitation. And I hope that the advocacy that I do on here will lead to changes made by these families or people who are watching it. And I have had literally hundreds, if not thousands of messages from people who say, I used to watch this stuff, I didn't see a problem with it, and now I, I hate it and I think it's bad. I even have vloggers who are like, I don't do this anymore I, I, until I heard your arguments about it. Maybe they don't want to be roasted by me, I don't know. But I've had countless, hundreds, if not thousands from just regular people saying they don't watch it anymore because they saw what I talk about and they agree with me. Consent. Children in family vlogs don't have the capacity to consent to their lives being broadcast. My content, however, it's my own agency at work. Does that make sense? So I discuss public figures who have chosen to be in the public eye, which is that argument I think is going to come up later. It's like, well, you only see 15 seconds of their life or, you know, uh, why do you get so mad or why are you commenting? What, what, what business, what business is it of yours? They put it on the internet. Transparency and accountability. This is a good one. By discussing these people, I'm pushing for transparency and accountability from content creators and the social media platforms that they are on. Now, it might not go anywhere, maybe not, but I think the overarching conversation and the, the noise that comes from it is changing things. People are listening. It's not exploitation, it's holding creators accountable for their choices and how they represent and potentially exploit their children and how they represent themselves too. One of the big things that pisses me off about how fake these people are is because people are comparing themselves to them and they want that and it's unattainable often. And we know that because half them get divorced down the road and they, and they like, it all collapses. Educational aspect of my channel. My videos might educate viewers on the psychological impacts of early internet fame, exposure, privacy rights, and child labor laws. I think it does. I think we cover all that stuff. We read the articles and we get, we get into it for sure which are not commonly understood topics. Like this is something that not everybody thinks about. That's why I get all these messages from people that say, look, I'm, I didn't even think of it that way. This educational value does not align with exploitation, by the way. It's just educational. So in essence, while I do cover family vloggers, my intent and the execution of my content differs fundamentally from the practices of those who I am critiquing. My work is a form of digital activism. I like that. Or a lot of people call it watchdog journalism or like, you know, citizen journalism or like just like private journalism. And I think that people who like who don't want to hear this argument and they want to continue to come at me for that, it might be beneficial to invite you to consider this. OK, consider the broader implications of not talking about it, of keeping silent on these issues versus the conversation that we're having. So people would like me to shut my mouth and not make fun of people's thumbs and everything else or or stick to the things that really that you can snark on and everything else. But like, again, staying silent on something, especially when it comes to child abuse, is not an answer, okay? So that's the first argument. That's my rebuttal to that. Then it goes, segues nicely into the mind your own business argument. How many times have you been on a family vlogger's account, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and someone like leaves a critique? And they might even be a hater. They're just leaving a critique. Like this happens a lot in Dr. D. Dozen's channel and they get the mind your business. It's not your money. What do you care? That kind of like comment. It's on the effing internet, dumbass. It's on a public forum. So YouTube is a public platform where content creators invite the interaction from their followers or from anybody. By posting a video publicly, creators implicitly welcome the comments critiques and engagement because it is engagement. This is why Dr. D. Dozen and a lot of other people in harvest the engagement by using rage. They do rage bait and they harvest their engagement that way and it is lucrative to a degree. It's not long-term effective, but it is lucrative. Rage bait is lucrative, okay? And Dr. does not does it in spades. There's a social contract. We talk about social currency. Well, this is a social contract. When you enter a public space, whether physical or digital, there is an unspoken agreement that others might engage with your presence or content, right? Your presence or your content. This is fundamental to social media dynamics. And it's also the scariest part of what happens to these kids with parasocial relationships and and people. I have parasocial relationships with people that I don't even know about. That is the fundamental danger of this, that it presents itself that way. And it's going to happen. Look at that video we covered of that guy that went to that girl's house. I have since discovered that that girl had a 60,000 subscriber channel. So it wasn't just some small channel. And it brought a guy to her front door. This is implicit, this is implied, it's going to happen. Whether or not it's a guy comes to your door or it's a super fan that meets you at an Arby's. Freedom of speech. <laughs> what business is yours? Well, I have freedom of speech. 
Just as the content creator has the freedom to express themselves like Doherty does and feeding their chickens that weigh 30 pounds, viewers have the freedom to respond. This is part of the democratic nature of the internet. And people who say, mind your business, well, why are you here? Mind not minding your business. Also, it's a place for constructive feedback, right? Comments can offer insights or suggestions for improvement. <laughs> Which is why when I go into a comment section like Doherty does, and then I see someone like honestly giving a thing like, why do you feed your kid 14,000 pounds of sugar? Do you not think that that's smart? And then you get the white nighters in there, okay? That person isn't a hater. They're actually honestly worried for the kids, but someone will go in and be like, F you for worrying about these kids. Accountability. Public figures or content creators on platforms like YouTube hold a degree of public accountability, whether they like it or not. They get paid a lot of money to do it too. So it comes with it. Comments can serve as a form of checks and balances holding creators accountable for their content. I consider myself the check and balance against what these people are doing. Now there's a lot of people who do what I do, okay? But there has to be checks and balances. And the way that I do the checks and balance or the balance that they are owed is I'm basically making fun of them for whatever I can find. Often it's just surface and it really is, okay? Do I really think that Alicia's thumbs are that bad? Yes, but no, do you know what I mean? Like I'm not, I could go way worse is what I'm saying to you, okay? And they deserve it. And I'm, some days I am pretty pissed, not gonna lie. Therefore, telling someone to mind your business in response to a comment on a public video seems counterintuitive to the very nature of the public content that they're creating. Okay, cool. I hope that helps some people. Okay, this one here. You only hate on women because you're a misogynist a-hole, okay? Needless to say, all the men that I've covered on my channel, and I roast, I, I think I'm pretty, when it comes to like roasting dudes, I get pretty upset. Because I think men have a different role to play here and they're supposed to be protecting their kids and often they don't and they like makes me way more mad at them. And I think that they, when there's a dude who is implicitly in this content, who is actually exploiting the children and is actively participating in it and like being there, like Cola Brandt, like the Weiss Life, like uh, Fizz Fam, like there are men that are just part of the whole thing and there are men who live in the peripheral, right? I roast those guys probably worse than I roast the women and they deserve every bit of it. Okay, the reason why it's mostly women I cover on here, um, it's because it's mainly women dominated. That's, and can you offer a counter argument or am I right? Either I'm right or I'm wrong. Is it a woman dominated field or not? There, do I have to say anything else? But I will say more things about it. I'm offering a diverse critique. My content critiques influencers regardless of gender. Okay, but again, it is a mainly women driven content creation. I, again, I've called out many male influencers and you guys know I have, and I'm pretty bad. Like I hate them. I focus on behavior, not gender, okay? Don't forget that. My critiques, again, are based on actions, ethics, and content quality, and their quality is usually shit, not the gender of the individual. Now, if they happen to be women, then I'll make fun of them for whatever I can find. That's just the way it is. And they generally tend to be women because it is a women, woman-dominated field. I don't have to say anymore. The demographics of this industry are 98% women, the end. There are maybe, Five channels out there that I could even name off the top of my head that are mainly just a dude and his kids. Now this one's kind of like, this one's kind of fair. It's the ad, it's the advocacy for authenticity. And that's what I try to be here. I try to be authentic. My content promotes authenticity and genuine interactions. So I do lives and I like to have people's comments, good or bad, especially when it comes to true crime, or real crime as I call it. I love that crowd-based conversation, okay? The authenticity is that you guys are here and often will correct me if I'm wrong. And if I'm real wrong, I will come out and be like, oh my gosh, I got that one super wrong. But some people will correct me if it's just a little thing and I appreciate it, right? So, and some people do it in a corrective manner and some people do it in a super hateful manner. But basically what I'm saying is that this is not the standard you should hold yourself to and these people are super fake and ridiculous. So stop comparing yourself to them. And I think in the end, that is, regardless of how I do it, I think it is exactly what we're doing here. And also where women might be criticized more harshly or unfairly by addressing these issues, especially when it comes to influencers, I'm not hating on women, but I'm highlighting the systemic problems that affect them and affect the things that you're watching. Like, do you ever feel like less than when you watch a perfect influencer or their perfect house and the beige shit and all the food that they're making and all the decorations that they have time to put out? Do you ever like count, you put yourself and stack yourself up against them and be like, I wish I could do that, right? I think that that's very detrimental and I think we need to call that out. And it's also encouragement for change, right? In the end, if family flogging didn't exist, I'd be very happy. My critiques are not about hate, but they're about encouraging positive change. And one of those positive changes is not exploiting children. It includes challenging the industry and social media concept. It includes challenging these influencers to evolve beyond gender stereotypes and promote content creators who are genuine regardless of their gender. There are great content creators out there who are really good at what they do and they are nothing like this. 
And that's who we should be giving our time to. That's who we should be making famous. It seems that we're making the most dumb people famous. That makes me angry to my core. Okay? Send the asteroid. Here's an argument. Why make fun of their looks and make fun of them overall? Why not just focus on their behavior? Now, I say, why not both? Why can't we have a little fun? Right? We can focus on the behavior, but at the same time, we can do it by calling them out for their shitty content, too, and their weird thumbs. It's called critique through satire. Okay? Focusing on behavior rather than appearance, humor can highlight the obscurity or the ethical lapses in family vlogging practices. For instance, satirizing the over-the-top reactions or scripted scenarios can expose the artificiality of their content. I know that sounds really wordy, but that basically what I'm saying there is that um, calling the absurdity of their content out shows it. It's like sat satirizing it. You're like making, like, so I do satire videos too. You're calling the, ex the, the absurdity out by being like, why are you doing that? Why is it like, why is your audio sound like this? Why do you sound like that? That's what I do. It's highlighting the ethical violations. By using a humorous tone, I can make ethical discussions more engaging. For example, I might mock their innocuous vlogging of children's everyday activities or their thumbs or their stupid makeup or their lip fillers or their fake boobs or whatever. But critiquing them is like subtly critiquing the lack of privacy and consent for the child. It has an overarching theme, right? I just add that to it. Cultural commentary. Snark allows for a critique of broader cultural narratives. If family vloggers promote a culture or consumerism or unrealistic family life, humor can punctuate these critiques. I use it as a punctuation. In the face. So I make viewers question their stuff by pointing it out in a satirical way. I think some of the most honest critiques in the world happen at roasts. Educating through ridicule. By making fun of certain practices like oversharing personal family drama for views, I educate my audience on what not to do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Don't wear the things that Whitney wears in uh, Mom Talk. This method can be more effective than trying than dry lecturing because it's memorable and relatable. Does that make sense? So to hear someone like Shiny Clown over there just drying it out for you, like, yeah, this is wrong. I do it with, with some, some zest, some zeal, some snark so that it's memorable. The joke lands. It's memorable. There are people out there who do deliver stuff and they're just dry. Would you prefer something funny? Like if you were at a college listening to a professor, would you prefer one that's engaging and funny or someone that's dry and boring? Hmm? Building community critique. This is where you guys all come in, okay? By using humor, we're not just critiquing, but also building a community around shared laughter and recognition of common issues, including the common sense of this all. That This community that we made here, we foster discussions and on ethical content creation, and we go beyond that. We have a little bit of fun. And I think the fun is the big part here. I think that's, I think we're having fun. Constructive criticism through irony. This is my favorite one. Okay, irony and snark can serve as tools for constructive criticism. For example, by ironically praising excessively mundane activities, which all these family vloggers do, as if they're like heroes of the world, like I woke up at 5 a.m. for five days, look at me. We're subtly critiquing the lack of substance and the oversimplification of parenting and family life. And that's what we do here. These people are so tone deaf to their privilege. And it's so ironic how some of them say that because they're like, look, this is real and raw. None of them are ever real, nor are they raw. Okay, because when it real and raw actually hits, that's them next day with white shirts on their white bed making apologies. I encourage self-reflection through snark and making fun of them. Through humorous critique, vloggers might be more inclined to self-reflect as the humor can sometimes bypass defenses that serious critiques might not. I use humor in a lot of my life to do that. I think it's important. Maybe it's a, a, a tool, a coping mechanism I created because of my how it was up brought up but like a lot of funny people are like that they probably have a really crappy upbringings and we use it as a tool but it can often bypass i have had multiple family vloggers reach out to me and say they love my videos even though you know they they do this but they've reached out and they said they love watching it because it the humor bypasses that if i was just being serious and i hate you and all this kind of stuff there's a perfect example of this when it came to um brampty they were watching my video and i have a video on this of them watching my video and I was getting to the surface level stuff and they were laughing about it. And then I got a little bit more heated and then their demeanor changed. And I realized that's okay. The humor broke through and they laughed a little bit about it. Even they're like, yeah, maybe he's right. And then I got real mean <laughs> and then they shifted. They weren't so accepting anymore. You should go watch the video. It's quite important. But using humor definitely breaks down defenses. I think so. Overall, this answer is the humor can be a powerful tool to make these critiques more digestible, more memorable and more impactful. Does that make sense? And I'm here to engage my audience. That's how we grow a channel. Don't forget, growing a channel gives me a louder voice, which gives me more power against these people. So there's a couple arguments I hear. Maybe I could do another video another day, but I've got to take Everly to ballet. But hear me out, okay? These arguments are silly because what we do here 
definitely makes an impact. Think to yourself and leave a comment below if I've changed your mind on something, good or bad, right or wrong, if I've changed your mind at least on family vlogging, okay? I think if I can change one person's mind or one family vlogger's mind, I've done my job, okay? If one changes and that helps a kid, that's amazing. There's nothing to scoff at. And I've interviewed people that have changed their mind. And I've, I've, I've encouraged people to change and they have. Okay, I got multiple interviews with people like that. I've gotten multiple private messages where people are like, yeah, you're right, I'm gonna stop, right? I've had multiple people get off the internet because of my snarking and they don't want me coming for them. And I'm not gonna say what it is because it's gonna spark debate, okay? In the end, I make fun of people, hear me out, because they deserve it, because they exploit children, which I think is abuse. And this is the tool that I have because it actually fosters engagement. It brings you to the channel. Even my haters, again, who watch every single detail and every pore on my face every single time, you're watching too, okay? It is the way it goes. Some people are like, well, in the difference between the obsessive nature of my snark thread and people are like, well, you're just the same. I don't know these people. I don't watch every video that they put out. I watch one and I critique it blind reacting to it. I don't keep up with it because I don't have any interest to. Okay, I'm a blind reactor and the things that come out of my face hole are the things that are, I'm hearing them for the first time too, a lot of the times. It's just how my brain works. Okay, but I think humor works and I think it works here. And the snark is actually working. I think it does. I think it's a very effective tool. What do you think below? I hope this video has helped a lot of you haters out there. I'm sure it has. I can't wait to read the thread on it. Again, I would go to my hate thread and speak to them. I would, but they kicked me out. Bunch of coward assholes. Anyway. Keep snarking. I appreciate it. it. Brings lots of views to my channel. And you guys who are here to hang out with me and enjoy the content, I appreciate it. Let's take a deep breath together. All is one. Haters and lovers together. Hmm? Yeah. Thanks for being here, guys. Let me know if there's any other arguments you've seen that you want me to address. Happy to do that. Um, but these are the main ones, and I think that we covered them pretty, pretty substantially. I think, again, overall, it's about the humor. And the humor is very, very, very disengaging for a lot of people. I think humor is like the tie that binds for a lot of things. I think you'd agree. Because you're awesome, amazing, incredible, and valuable. And don't you forget it. I'll see you when I see you.